I talk a lot about question answering and Manchester paradigm questions on my videos. A link in the description if you don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, but one piece of criticism that I get is that I talk too much about American questions. And that's true. For better or for worse, America in the 20th century has had an outsized impact on popular culture worldwide. And I'm an American, and of course I'm going to talk about the things that I know. So today I'm going to talk about how non-American Manchester style questions with humans help expose the chains of thought that are used to uncover how to answer questions. And Hopefully this will inspire some of you to dig deeper into these sources of questions because they are underused. I think criminally so at the moment. And while we're doing that, we'll also be able to talk about how some of the great stuff that's happening around the world provides new ways of looking at data. And this isn't a new development. One of the reasons it makes sense to contrast the Manchester paradigm with the Cranfield paradigm is that Granada Studios in the United Kingdom copied Dan Reed's College Bowl to create University Challenge. And I've been pleasantly surprised to see the Manchester paradigm, particularly the pyramidal question format, where questions can be interrupted, expand to new settings. For example, in Ecuador, International Academic Competitions is living up to its name by hosting Spanish language competitions. Presidente Salvador Allende utilizó Dígame la... Chile. No es esa la respuesta correcta. Así que vamos a continuar. Utilizó una pistola para que, que dio Fidel Castro para defenderse de los insurgentes de la derecha. In that clip, the player didn't calibrate their certainty and answered a little prematurely, letting the other team hear the rest of the question. In Japan's ABC competition, short for Alternative Basic Classic, like University Challenge is a competition between universities. And the format limits questions to less than 60 characters, which make it even more challenging to structure questions well. Nevertheless, they're able to structure questions pyramidally, going from difficult clues to easy ones. For example, this question is structured pyramidally so that it can be interrupted by a smart student. He was able to identify that if you don't want to say he or she, they is a gender neutral option without getting to the part where the question that explicitly defines that they is the English third person plural pronoun. I'm really pleased by these data being increasingly online for two reasons. First, a nice side effect of pyramidal questions spreading to new countries is that AI researchers are starting to build systems that explicitly do calibration word by word to interrupt these questions, such as this paper from the ACL Student Research Workshop in 2023. Second, having multilingual question answering data sets is useful because it helps us evaluate how well our machine translation systems work. Here's a paper from our group that does exactly that. Imagine you're on a Polish game show, but you don't know the language. We can then use this setting as an evaluation for translation systems. Take the translation and feed it into a question answering system, either a human or a computer since it's cheaper. And this evaluation setup requires that you only translate the answer. You don't need to have a translation of the entire question because after all, uh, the Polish question gets translated into English and you create an answer in English, you just need to check whether the answers line up. We showed that this evaluation setup can detect hallucinations when models just make stuff up. If you plot the probability of the correct answer on the y-axis and have words come in one by one over time and plot the probability as you go along, the questions are structured so that the clues go from hard to easy. So the probability of the correct answer should monotonically increase as you go along. At the end of the question, it should just about be one. But if you have clues that come in 
that confuse the system or get mistranslated, whenever the probability dips, that's a sign that you've made a mistake. Machine translation systems also have another problem under translation, just not translating anything or just translating filler words. This could also be diagnosed when the probability of the correct answer just stays flat. If you want to learn more about that, I have a link to Hyojung's full video about this paper in the description. And apart from having more data, another advantage of the Manchester paradigm question answering format expanding to new countries is that we now have a broader coverage of more cultures. For example, the Indian quizzing community centered in Kolkata is producing pyramidal questions. In this case, it isn't exactly how I would do it. If you don't get the answer immediately, you get a multiple choice set of options and then you get two chances. Not exactly how I do it. Nevertheless, still pyramidal technically and we're getting a lot more questions about cricket. For LMB, LMB wanted a question on Indian cricket. We all love Indian cricket, but they specifically wanted a question on Indian men's cricket. Here's your question. Name the 87-year-old veteran cricket coach who has produced more internationally acclaimed players, including Kirti Azad, Ajay Jadeja, and Maninder Singh. But let's come back to the United Kingdom. Apart from the paradigm's name, the United Kingdom has had an outsized influence on the Manchester paradigm. The ubiquitous pub quiz grew out of UK drinking establishments in the 70s. I talked about how some of these questions could be useful for multimodal QA in another video, link in the description. But the UK isn't the only example of this. Another example of this is Sto Gidye Kagda, which was developed by Vladimir Vorshilov for Soviet Central Television. What I think is great about this is that the questions are not just a test of knowledge, but also a test of reasoning and logic. Another aspect I like about this show is that it's inherently adversarial. Viewers write questions, mail them in, and then the envelopes that they came in are placed around something like a roulette wheel, and then the question is selected by spinning the wheel, and presented. Often it's a multimodal question. Sometimes even an actual object that somehow reflects the question. Let's take a listen to this question. Three. Против вас играет электросварщик Сергей Колесов из Твери. Внимание! Набросок на черном ящике. In this case, they're asking who is the author of this piece of music and who sketched this out. I think this is a great question because while it does require knowledge, it also requires piecing information together. It's a musician. What might a musician draw or sketch out? Perhaps an album cover? What could those lines be? And there are four dots on those lines. Those stripes might be viewed from above. Maybe it could be zebra stripes on a road. And those dots could be people. So what might this be a picture of? Where this might be useful for training AI is that it's not just the questions and answers that are useful, uh, but also the thought process that the panel works through together to come to an answer. Also a component of pub quizzes and building a community of viewers to create challenging questions would create a new evaluation framework and I think it would work not just for Sto Gidi Kagda, but also for evaluating AI systems. A twist on this talk it out framework is where you can ask questions to help you get to the answer. This is associated with a number of British quiz programs, the most notable of which is QI, 
where not all of the questions are useful. Many of the panelists are comedians and, and don't give serious responses, but in many cases you do get a good thought process. So, for example, when this question comes in... What conclusion did the great biologist Stephen Jay Gould draw from a lifetime study of fish? Then they discuss a preferred ontology of what is and what isn't a fish, talking about, for instance, what's on a menu. There's a division, isn't there, in the world, whether it should be down to sort of uh, experts in biology, whether things are fish or, or whether it should be down to menus. If you've created a something, then something has to be that something, otherwise you haven't created a something. So <laughs> it has to be a fish if there is the idea oh, of a fish in the first place. A salmon is more related to, say, a camel than it is to a hagfish. But after a couple of jokes, they wind up getting the correct answer. So, after a lifetime study of fish, biologist uh, Stephen Jay Gould concluded that there's no such thing as a fish. Another Brit, Tom Scott, created a slightly more serious spin-off called Lateral, emphasizing lateral thinking that also involves this dialogue with the host to figure out what the answer is. For example, in this challenge, Tom Scott brought in a guest host who posed this question. So the question is, uh, Congressman and lawyer Clement Vallandigham was defending Thomas McGeehan in a murder trial. McGeehan was accused of shooting a well-known tough guy, Thomas Myers, in the stomach. How did Vallandigham get his client acquitted? This joke question got a response that led them to start thinking about mortality. God <laughs> intervened. <laughs> Something? Uh, you, you, might, you might say that. Once they know that it's a life or death situation, they can then figure out the circumstances. The gun was was faulty and triggered by itself. That uh, that was the the argument that was being made. Yes. And get to the right answer. Did anybody <laughs> get shot in the courtroom? Yes. Huh? Okay. Did the lawyer shoot himself? The lawyer shot himself. Minus the jokes, this is the kind of thought process that we want AI systems to undertake, either as the quiz master, say in educational settings, or in developing hypotheses, testing them, and coming to the correct conclusion. Now that question answering is moving beyond answering factoid trivia questions, these kinds of interactions are going to be what makes the Manchester paradigm particularly valuable, not just for AI researchers in the United States like me, but I hope for the entire world. This is just one video from a course that I'm teaching. If you want to get the whole context, check out the course webpage linked below. There you can find all of the videos in the right order. YouTube likes to show you older videos out of order, homeworks, exercises, and recommended readings. And if you want to help other people find videos like this, please be sure to like and subscribe to provide a big gradient to the algorithm.